I just kind of want to hear how y'all are thinking about the market. I mean, <laughs> I don't know much. I know I, I I know a little bit about multifamily. Um, it seems like there's a lot more bridge debt in multifamily, and that tends to be the headline right now. It's more financing issues rather than like vacancy issues. But how are y'all thinking about the market? I mean, this is you can make an argument an amazing time to launch a business right at a fractured time where there's going to be some opportunities. Are the opportunities going to be in the bigger deals, the smaller deals? Like, let's just have a market discussion to bring it home. Yeah, I think I think this is the biggest risk to the business right now. And that, you know, if you gave us a significant amount of capital to go deploy in multifamily, it'd be very hard to do. I mean, Moses is case in point number one. Um, but I think you, we, we really believe you're starting to see the signs of stress. Okay. Right? You know, what are those signs? Just you're starting to see some of the, I mean, at the end of the day, for me, it's the fundamentals at the asset level, yeah. right? So, you know, especially here in Texas, you're obviously seeing pressure around your insurance costs, uh, costs tax. Um, there's, we all know what's happened with interest rates. As you mentioned, there's a lot of people that have bought assets and, you know, 21, 22, probably not, probably not that well capitalized, um, with loans that are starting to mature. So, but what we don't know is when all that, you know, how bad will it be? Will we have a recession? How much will that impact the operating fundamentals? And then you really need to know the answer to those questions Mm. to know how much distress will be in the marketplace. And whether it'll be in the large transactions or the, sm- the smaller transactions. Yeah, and I, for me, I would just say that I, I, um, I am much more. I'm more focused than on the uh, fundamentals than I am on the financing. Like yeah. I kind of think if the if, and the employment situation is really good. Like huh. you know, there's basically anyone who wants a job in America can get one right now. I mean, notwithstanding some of the like the doom and gloom you sometimes hear yeah. from, on, on Twitter and other places. Like it anyone can get dark on Twitter and quick. people like I, I feel like sometimes that. This is like a, I don't want to get on a rant here, but there, it's like sometimes people, it's like they're op, they're talking with information that's from five or 10 years ago. Yeah. There's like, you know, there's like, the, 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 and politicians are like this too. It's like, they're talking about a world where it's hard to get a job. And it's like, if you have a pulse and you can fall out of your front door right now, <laughs> you can get hired, yeah. right? So, uh, and, and so uh, as long as that is the case, then, and people can keep paying their rent, then- Okay, you know, you're, you have these financing issues. Like, you know, there'll be rescue equity. There'll be people. Maybe the banks let them work it out. Like, there's, you can sort of solve financing problems. Yeah. If, uh, for whatever reason, uh, and by the way, the Fed is pushing in this direction. Employment weakens, and uh, people are not filling those apartments. And you start to see vacancy go up, and then you start to see rents to come down. Then I think the financing becomes more of an issue because it's like it's one thing to come to your LPs and say, "Look, we we need a couple million bucks here to avoid losing the building. We're going to do a it sucks, but we're going to do a cash in refi. But hey, the building's performing pretty well, and you liked the asset before, so you probably still like it now, and that's all fine. Your LPs probably hold their nose and they write the check. Okay, mm-hmm. it's another thing. If you're coming to them and you're saying, well, I need the two million. And by the way, like the wheels are falling off at an operating level. Yeah. Right. Um, so, you know, so, so again, that's like a very long, fancy way of saying like, we'll see. But it's to me, it's like really about employment and, and whether people are paying. And in your market, you have, go ahead. I was just going to say that it's, it's fun to talk like in generality. Yeah. But in the reality, I mean, in the reality, when you look at the supply in Austin or Nashville, it's very different than supply in, Denver, Birmingham, or, you know, pick your market. So right. at the end of the day, it's very micro, micro market specific. That's why I love it. Are you seeing any sign like first cracks in LA? LA is so interesting. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to try to avoid sounding too downbeat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, um, being really frank, like uh, the city has not allowed um, uh, owners of rent stabilized buildings to raise the rent since March of 2020. Okay. And will not again until March of 2024. Okay. And so what that has meant is that there is much now. Now, look, look. There's the normal turnover. People left. People. Left, that's all fine. What has happened is um, there's much less turnover than there was previously because people are like, every you know, their salaries are going up, rents in the spot market are going up, but the rent that they're actually paying to their landlord is flat and and and, and flat in in uh, in nominal terms in a high inflationary environment means down in real terms. Uh, so it's, it's like a big wealth transfer from me to to tenants. 
Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, so what's going? So there's this weird thing going on in LA where the vacancy rate is very low, right? No one's moving, right? So so there's much less turnover than you would expect because of this rent stabilization issue. Um, for a while there, the result was that there was a lot of there's very little vacancy, and so rents were going crazy. For rents in the spot market, it was awesome. Like last year, rents were going nuts. Um, that has tailed off. That now rents, it depends on the neighborhood. It's very neighborhood specific, but like um, in our best neighborhoods, they're still up. In our worst neighborhoods, uh, they have started to come down a little bit. Interesting. So that's what I'm watching really carefully. Okay. Um, when you think about like uh, the, the if, if there was a coming recession, we just heard yesterday Blackstone raised their new $31 billion <laughs> fund. Uh, seems like, you know, I've, I've been in meetings and I've heard there's 270 billion of committed capital. Um, you know, you come from a big money world, your career, is that all hearsay? Is that all, or is it different this time in that there really is a lot of capital and there's kind of a floor baked into this real estate market because of how much capital there is like, what goes through your mind when you think about the cap, the committed capital? Yeah, I think there's, uh, capital available, and then propensity to commit capital when you start to see stress. Yeah. And so there is a ton of capital that's on the sidelines. Yeah. But when you think about large institutions where you're taking uh, an investment through an investment committee, it's not exactly the place that, you know, they're really going to double down and get aggressive when the markets start to fall apart. So right. It's really going to, I mean, if we see a lot of stress at the operating level, uh, you know, I, I think that capital will likely, you know, some of it will come in the market, but I think there'll be a lot of opportunity. Uh, the other thing to say is that the last time we went through one of these, so like when when we were all getting started in the yep. you know oh wait whatever, um, the 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 regulators allowed or encouraged the banks to extend and pretend on the loans. Um, I think it's reasonably likely that that will not happen this time. Mm. So I think um, I, the banks are better capitalized. There seems to be, I mean, already you're seeing people send keys in and stuff like that. There seems to be. Uh, uh, a willingness uh, uh, from the banks to take back assets that there was not the last time. Um, and so, you know, who knows early days, but there's not that buffer. Like, so, yeah, yeah. so maybe there's equity available, but there may not be, there may not be debt available. Do you, when you think of sub institutional assets and I'm, I'm, I'm generally curious, um, do you think there's more distress in sub institutional than there is in the bigger stuff, or is it because the bigger stuff, most of that is non recourse? It's probably professionally managed, where they're like, "Take it back. We know you'll lend to us again." And in the smaller world, these are people's livelihoods. It's a lot more at stake. I can speak to COVID. Like every credit tenant we had were all the ones that wanted to. <laughs> that we heard from their lawyers like week one, and all the mom and pops were the ones like, "We'll do anything." If you think about that at ownership level, and again, I was young in 08, so I can't really, I haven't really thought about it. Is there going to be less distress or more distress depending on how big the deal is? I think, I, like, look, I'm not an expert across all asset classes and all sizes. What I have seen both in my own market, but also frankly on Twitter, um, is that uh, there are a lot of undercapitalized syndicators who yeah. got into the business to do a 5 million or a 10 million or something. And then, Crazily, you started seeing them do twenty million and fifty million. This ding dong in Houston who just got himself <laughs> lost a few hundred million dollar portfolio about five minutes after he bought it. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, so I think there and 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 someone like that, like there, you know, the LPs are probably looking at things on a. For, for those people, they didn't have long term LP relationships. The LPs were very transactional. So. When he go when that guy turns around and calls the seventy five LPs and says, "Hey, I need you to double down on this asset where the wheels are falling off," the, the LPs are like, "Who is this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know you, and you just screwed up." And you're like, no, like that's you know, so right? true. Uh, and so I think that that's going to be there's that th there's going to be some distress there. Now the question is, like. Uh, we wouldn't have paid the prices that the guy paid on the first on the way in, yeah. right? <laughs> like that, that's why he bought it, and we didn't buy it, right? So, the question is, uh, at, at what point? And oh, and by the way, also a lot of the assets those people were buying are assets that we probably wouldn't want to own, right? Right. So the question is, um, does I think there will be distress there, 
a lot of those people also use floating rate bridge loans. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, it's a, like a whole list of do not, do not, do not. Um, uh, the question is, do you know? Do we want to own those assets, and at what price? Yeah, you know, and there, and and the truth is that probably you're willing to own a lot. There's probably a lot of assets that you're willing to own at if the price is right. Yeah. And the question is just, does the price get right? Yeah, you said something earlier. Uh, I'm I'm I just looking at my note, but I think this recession is going to be. I think we're about to find out there was a lot of like middle management and white collar work that was just totally not needed. You've already seen it in the tech world, Um, but I think you could make the argument. And then it's the first time like our blue collar economy is like so underemployed right now. The joke is like, what does a plumber make? Whatever he wants. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying all the white collars, but it's an interesting dynamic as you think about rent payers, especially at the higher end of the market. I'm not saying that they're going to get fired and go get hired somewhere else. I think we're about to discover there's just a lot of irrelevant jobs that didn't need to exist. Well, I think, I mean, it, and to your point, I mean, we and we've had this conversation on Twitter and other places about work from home. I, like, and I think you can see this in the tech companies. I think, I think, uh, people went home, productivity plummeted. The response, because a lot of the businesses were actually doing quite well, was to throw bodies at the problem. Yep. Like, okay, we've, we, you know, the people are not that productive, but, but the top line's growing really fast. So we're just going to, oh, we got it. We got a service. We got to service our customers. So we're going to hire. And so there's a lot of hiring that took place. Uh, and I think that, as you said, a lot of those, a lot of those people who got hired, like maybe if productivity had been at a reasonable level to start with, yeah. would not have been hired in the first place. Yeah. yeah. The other thing to say on that is that if you look at the supply, there's a lot of talk about how we're hitting record supply, but the reality is you are in some markets. In other markets, you're not. Yep. And we all know that the vast majority of that supply is in that kind of nice luxury product. Yeah. And I would imagine uh, the situation you've described is really that's the target market. Yeah. So I would. Um, so our expectation is that's where you'll see uh, the stress. No, I I I live it in the industrial world. They're they're building. You can go build all their big class A big box you want. It does not impact. It's just a totally different different world, world. than yeah. what you know, sub-institutional class B value add. It's just a different ballgame. 